Castration resistant prostate cancer, diagnosis and testing consideration with the emerging use of PARP inhibitors. As a result of participating in this activity, learners will be able to discuss current standards of care and the anticipated future use of PARP inhibitors in patients with castration resistant prostate cancer. Explain the results of recent clinical trials and ongoing investigational efforts in the use of PARP inhibitors for the treatment of patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer. Describe potential molecular and whole exome sequencing tests, considerations, and tissue requirements for assessing the suitability for PARP inhibitors in response to treatment in patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer discuss evidence-based rationale for interpreting test results and reporting to other clinicians. Prostate cancer continues to remain a significant personal and population health issue for men. To give some idea of the scope of the burden, for 2020, the American Cancer Society estimates there will be about 192,000 new cases of prostate cancer and a little over 33,000 deaths due to prostate cancer. In fact, it's projected to be the leading cause of cancer and the second leading cause of cancer-related death in men. The mortality due to prostate cancer has shown a fairly steep decline of about, on average, 4% per year over the 20 years from 1993 to 2013. However, death rates have stabilized in recent years, which may be a result of decreased screening, and there has been a subsequent increase in the diagnosis of distant stage disease. So although there has been much concern about overdiagnosis and overtreatment, Prostate cancer remains a significant cause of cancer-related uh, death in men. Most prostate cancers are diagnosed and treated at a localized stage, and while it is true that many tumors are indolent, some are metastatic and others develop metastatic disease after initial treatment, which usually includes androgen deprivation therapy with or without chemotherapy. Initially, the response to androgen deprivation therapy is very good, but eventually nearly all patients develop resistance uh, and progressive disease termed castration-resistant prostate cancer. Therapeutic options for this lethal phase of the disease are limited, and additional therapeutic development is a pressing need. Currently, there's a lot of enthusiasm for what has been termed precision medicine, an approach that seeks to leverage in particular tumor genetic and genomic information to develop and deploy therapeutics targeted at a patient's cancer, uh, the goal being a more individualized, thus more effective uh, therapy. The medicine approach to prostate cancer has been greatly advanced by the advent of high-throughput genomic technologies, in particular, massively parallel genomic uh, sequencing, or NGS, next generation sequencing. In a landmark multi-institutional study, the genomics of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, Robinson et al. demonstrated some striking findings. In total, 89% of metastatic castrate-resistant uh, prostate cancer uh, contained clinically actionable molecular ab aberrations, a high prevalence. A number of biological pathways uh, were involved, including the antigen signaling pathway, the PI3 kinase and Wnt pathways, cell cycle uh, genes, and of particular relevance for today's discussion, the DNA uh, repair pathway. Specifically, 23% of metastatic castration-resistant uh, prostate cancer had DNA pathway repair aberrations. It was found that the DNA pathway repair genes BRCA2, BRCA1, and ATM had aberration at greater frequency in metastatic disease as compared with primary prostate cancers. And intriguingly, germline aberrations in DNA repair genes were described in 8% of metastatic tumors. These findings have been supported by several subsequent studies. For example, as part of the PROFOUND study, 
the largest central perspective NGS study of homologous recombination repair mutational tissue testing was reported recently at ASCO. Mutations were found in about 28% of cases, most frequently BRCA2, 9.7%, followed by CDK12 at 7.1% and ATM at 6.3% and multiple other genes at a lower frequency. Interestingly, mutations in more than one homologous recombination repair gene were found in 7.6% in of patients. Regarding somatic mutations, let me mention one very interesting recent report. Uh, Matteo and co-workers found that aberration in DNA damage repair pathway genes were found already in the primary uh, prostatic biopsies of patients who subsequently developed metastases suggesting that this is an early event in aggressive disease. Uh, turning to germline DNA repair mutations, in a large uh, multi-institutional study, Pritchard found that 11.8% of men with metastatic prostate cancer had mutations in homologous recombination repair genes, in particular BRCA2, ATM, CHECK2, and BRCA1, and found that the prevalence was significantly higher and that seen uh, in localized uh, prostate cancer in, in ranged from 2.7 to 4.6%. Interestingly, the frequency of mutation did not differ by age of diagnosis or by family history of prostate cancer. In another recent study, Castro reported a slightly higher prevalence with BRCA2 again being the most highly prevalent homologous recombination repair. It was also reported that patients with germline BRCA2 mutations had worse prostate cancer survival and germline mutations were an independent prognostic factor for cause-specific uh, survival. Let us look now at the biology of the DNA damage repair pathways. Human DNA is continuously being damaged. There are endogenous sources of damage, such as reaction of DNA with naturally occurring reactive oxygen species spontaneous hydrolysis of bases, or errors in replication or recombination. They may also be exogenous sources of damage, such as X-rays, UV, or chemical uh, mutagens. If DNA repair mechanisms are compromised, genomic instability and mutability may ensue, which are key enabling characteristics for the process of tumorigenesis. In order to protect genomic integrity, a complex uh, cellular signaling ma machinery has evolved, comprising multiple partially overlapping pathways. Different forms of DNA damage induce a response from different branches of the DNA repair system. In general, when the cell detects DNA damage, cell cycle checkpoints are activated and the cell cycle is halted to allow repair. If repair is successful, the cell can continue the cell cycle. If not, cell apoptosis or senescence ensues. When damage is limited to one of the DNA strands, the repair pathways that are engaged include the single-stranded break repair pathway, base excision repair, nucleotide excision repair, and mismatch repair. To ensure fidelity of repair, each of these use the undamaged complementary strand as a template. Importantly for today's discussion, single-strand breaks that are not repaired before DNA replication occurs uh, will collapse replication forks, leading to formation of double-strand breaks, which require homologous combination for repair. The different pathways that comprise uh, the DNA damage response mechanism are complex, with many components, including sensors, transducers, and effectors. You will note that the majority of the somatic and germline mutations that we discussed are found here in the homologous recombination repair pathway. You'll also note that aberrations in particular have implications for particular tumor types, and specifically for the purposes of today's discussion, prostatic adenocarcinoma. The primary pathways involved in double-stranded uh, break repair are the homologous recombination and the non-homologous end joining repair systems. Homologous repair needs a sister chromatid for a template and so is restricted to the S or G2 phase of the cell cycle, but it does restore the DNA error-free. On the other hand, non-homologous end joining uh, acts to ligate broken DNA ends without a template. It functions throughout the cell cycle, but in consequence, it's error-prone and results in errors that are permanent, 
including rearrangements, insertions, and deletions, and may result in genomic instability. Poly-ADP ribose polymerase 1, or PARP1, is a DNA damage sensor and signal transducer that is primarily involved in the repair of single-strand DNA breaks. It binds to the DNA break and then synthesizes poly-ADP ribose, or PAR, chains on target proteins and on itself using NAD as a cofactor. The PAR relation of proteins near the DNA break is thought to mediate DNA repair by modifying chromatin structure and by localizing DNA repair effectors. The autoparylation of PAR1 leads to its release uh, from the area of DNA damage. In order to understand how the inhibition of PARP1 leads to cell death, we need to briefly consider the concept of synthetic lethality. This refers to the scenario where two proteins, or more generally two components of a system, function in a way where either can be lost and the cell still survives, but if both are lost together, cell death ensues. The synthetic lethality in this case is between PARP1 function and the process of homologous recombination repair. The synthetic lethality between these two processes is shown schematically here. PARP inhibitors mimic nicotinamide and cause two things to happen. They catalytically inhibit parylation, which inhibits the repair of single-strand breaks. They also lead to trapping of PARP1 on the damaged DNA, which stalls the replication fork. Both of these processes lead to DNA double-strand breaks. In a normal cell with normal homologous recombination repair, the double-strand breaks are repaired and the cell survives. But if the cell is homologous recombination repair deficient, it will use the alternative non-homologous end-joining uh, pathway, which, as we said before, is error-prone, eventually leading to genomic fragmentation and cell death. In fact, this synthetic lethality was demonstrated in two landmark nature papers back in 2005, comparing the effect of PARP inhibitors in cells with and without BRCA1 and 2. Here is a representative figure from one of the papers showing the profound hypersensitivity to a PARP uh, inhibitor of cells that are deficient in BRCA2 as compared with BRCA2 proficient cells. These preclinical studies provided evidence for the potential use of PARP inhibitors in BRCA1 and 2 mutated cancers, and subsequently, the PARP inhibitor Olaparib received FDA approval for the treatment of germline BRCA1 and 2 mutated breast and ovarian cancers. At this point, I would like to pass over uh, to Dr. Mullen to discuss the potential role of PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer. The value of PARP inhibitors clinically in metastatic prostate cancer has been demonstrated uh, recently in a series of uh, wonderful studies that we will go through now providing some new opportunities of treatment in this precision medicine um, paradigm that, that Dr. Berry was explaining. So the first um, understanding of this is with some papers that described the prevalence of this problem in the metastatic prostate cancer population. And if we look at both the incidence and of DNA repair defects or HRD defects, in patients with localized and metastatic disease, we see it's relatively similar. Demonstrating this is, an, for most men, an early event in their prostate cancer development. And so we can see that as demonstrated here from Teo on the figure on the left. Uh, this is the proportion of patients that have DNA repair defects um, in metastatic disease. And notice that BRCA2 is, again, one of the higher frequency events. Now, one comment here, if you look at the specific types of DNA repair defects in the graph it, that with the genes listed in the column on the right, the very most commonly cited is TP53, followed by RB and BRCA2. So it's very important to remember that the definition of these terms, DNA repair defect and homologous recombination repair defects, these are not universally accepted terms, specifically in terms of which genes compromise that genotype. So, for instance, in their publication here, they're including TP53, 
three is an example of the gene that could be altered to define someone as having DNA repair deficient status, whereas other groups do not include TP53. So it's very important when you're when you're reading and analyzing these papers to look specifically at which genes are included in that specific study so that you can better understand the results um, that they are that they are showing you. Whereas if, if we look at the figure on the right in terms of the TCGA data set, the, so these are localized prostate cancer patients. Again, the incidence of BRCA1 to ATM is lower than in the metastatic disease setting, but still present in close to the same incidence. Mateo's group compared the incidence of each individual genes from their data set, again, the metastatic setting, compared to the DCG8 data set, again, the localized disease setting, and found that most of the DNA repair defect genes are not statistically different in terms of incidence. Other genes can be, for instance, TP53, S pop mutations. In terms of the DNA repair defects, they seem to be relatively similar in terms of incidence. So the next important concept is that the DDR status is prognostic in the localized disease setting. So alterations to these genes significantly alter the biology of, of the disease. So in this retrospective study from the Johns Hopkins group, they selected high-grade localized disease as they defined it as Gleason grade group four or five, and they compared it against a cohort that they determined as, as clinically having indolent disease. So they selected patients with Gleason grade group one for that cohort. This is only based on germline testing and does not include patients that have somatic alterations, any of these DNA repair genes. And specifically, they were looking at, they defined DDR status as alterations to ATM, BRCA1 and 2, CHECK2, HOXB13, MLH1 and MSH2, MSH6, NBN, PALB2, MS2, RAD51, D, and TP53. Of note here, the genes that are universally included uh, to date in all research reports include ATM, BRC1, and 2. Some of these other genes are not commonly included, like COXB15, TP53. Uh, MSH2 is equivocably included, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So again, they, they do have some unique genes that are included that are not present in, in other groups. So if you look at the frequency of various clinical factors that we know are prognostic, there was a difference, as you would expect, specifically uh, selected high Gleason grade group uh, patients versus low. So there's a significant difference in the tumor stage, proportion of patients that eventually develop metastatic disease, those patients that died of prostate cancer. So these baseline characteristics really validate that they selected a difference in terms of prognosis of the disease. So then if you look at those patients that were mutation carriers versus non-carriers, you see a significant difference, again, as defined by clinical characteristics. Uh, simple vesicle invasion, the tumor stage, uh, with, with carriers having a higher proportion of T3 disease compared to those patients that are non-carriers, and the proportion of patients that have higher PSA diagnosis was favored the carriers over non-carriers. So they took all of those factors and, and both univariate analysis as well as multivariate model to determine which factors were the most significant in terms of defining a poor prognosis. And some of those clinical factors clearly were important, as, as we know from various previous studies, such as a higher PSA diagnosis. But they also found that, well, and also high-grade disease, i.e. Gleason score was very important in terms of defining the But mutation carrier status of these three genes was also significant. Although it's important to note that, at least in their study, it was not significant enough that it retained significance. Again, these other clinical factors are extremely powerful in terms of, of PSA and, and Gleason score. So the clinical value or efficacy of this strategy of, of doing PARP inhibitors for patients with metastatic prostate cancer was first explored in a pilot study that was published in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine by, by Matteo and Devono's group. So this was a single arm phase two clinical trial and patients were treated until there was evidence of radiographic disease progression or unequivocal clinical disease progression, for instance, the spinal cord compression 
PSA metrics alone were not sufficient to determine progression. Radiographic disease assessments were done every 12 weeks, and the primary endpoint in terms of response rate was this amalgamation of radiographic disease progression, changes in circulating tumor cell count, or a PSA reduction of greater than or equal to 50%. So they had 50 patients enrolled from 2012 until 2014. Of note, the inclusion criteria did not stipulate selection for patients with BRCA or I should say DNA repair or HRD alterations. This was not a biomarker selected trial, so all patients were to enroll. The median age was slightly lower than you would expect for an advanced prostate cancer population, but not significantly. It's approximately the age that we see for a lot of these clinical trials where they're enriching for a healthier population. Um, but they did include some elderly patients. Note that the range goes up to almost 80 years old. Time since diagnosis suggested a somewhat more favorable biology of disease with a median of five years. And the ECOG performance status, as you would expect, predominantly was ECOG 0 1 patients, as we commonly see in a lot of clinical trials. The number of prior regimens that patients had received for castrate resistant prostate cancer was, was quite a few, more than or equal to four. So these were very advanced patients that had exhausted, for the most part, other FDA-approved therapies. And you can see that specifically looking at which treatments have been received previously. Half of the patients initially were diagnosed with localized disease and so had undergone previously a radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy. Most of all the patients had been treated with abiraterone acetate. And some of the patients, about a third, had also received enzalutamide. All of them had received chemotherapy, at least one cycle. Looking at the types of mutations and the response to treatment, we see a very stark difference in terms of genotype. So those patients that had DNA repair alterations noted here in the left under response to elaborate were much more likely to respond to the treatment compared to those patients that did not have a DNA alteration. For the most part, the patients that did not have a DNA alteration did not respond to this treatment. Of note, patient number 11 uh, is the one exception. This patient did not have a DNA repair alteration and did respond to the treatment. And there were some patients that had DNA alterations that did not respond to treatment, although the majority of them did not. And you can see the types of alterations are quite broad, so the type of alteration did not seem in this study to predict response or not response. Whether it was a single copy deletion versus homozygous deletion versus a sense mutation, the time of the alteration, i.e. germline versus somatic, also did not seem to predict response to this therapy. As you can see, germline events are those that are highlighted with a star, and somatic alterations do not have a star. And, and there's alterations or responses in patients that have germline as well as somatic. We can see this depth of the response a little bit better with this Kaplan-Meier curve. And here they have it broken up into biomarker negative patients in the red dashed line versus biomarker positive patients, the solid blue line. Those patients that were biomarker positive had a significantly better response. And those patients that were biomarker negative for the most part did not. Now remember, part of the response criteria was radiographic progression free survival. And the first scans were done at month three, which is why it goes from nearly 100% to less than 25% at that first interval. So again, very few patients responded. They also reported on CTC conversion rates and PSA response rates, and I would refer you to the manuscript to see those. So given the great initial results that we saw from that study, a second follow-up validation trial called the Topark P study was conducted. So this was a multi-center open-label randomized trial. So all patients received PARP inhibitor, but they were randomized to either a laparib 300 milligrams twice daily or 400 milligrams twice daily. So this had somewhat of a dose finding component built into it. The endpoints and the reason for discontinuation were similar to TOPARC A. Radiological assessments were done every 12 weeks. The primary endpoint was that same conglomerate endpoint of PSA reduction of greater than or equal to 50%, radiographic response per resist, or CTC conversion rates. And treatment similarly continued until radiographic disease progression or unequivocal clinical disease progression, such as spinal compression, and was not based on PSA metrics. So in total, 98 patients were randomized and enrolled between 2015 and 2018. 
Um, there were 161 DNA repair defect positive patients out of 592. For this trial, patients were required to have DNA repair defect in the results of COPARP A. So as you can see from the baseline characteristics, again, these are fairly advanced patients with the majority of patients having previously received but all of the patients having received docetaxel, many of the patients up to almost half having also received cabazitaxel, half of the patients had received abiraterone, and again, half had received enzalutamide. And the number of patients that had received one of those agents was almost 100% and equally balanced between the 300 and 400 milligram doses. The types of DNA damage response gene alterations are, are shown in the uh, second uh, figure on the right. The majority of patients had alterations to BRCA1 or 2 or ATM with a healthy representation of CDK12. And we can see that uh, graphically shown here with a significant proportion of patients having a truncating mutation as shown in the black dot. And the second most common alteration was a homozygous deletion with a few patients having in frame mutations. Again, most patients had somatic alterations and a smaller proportion had germline. In terms of the response, so again, here in, in this graph, it's separated based on dose, 300 milligrams versus 400 milligrams. And there was not a significant signal activity between these two doses. You can see that the blue line representing 300 milligrams consistently across these four figures and the 400 milligram dose consistently represented by the color across these four figures, very equivalent. So if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve in the bottom left, you can see uh, the two response or time to is the same between both. Depth of response as shown in the bottom right, again, is similar between the, the two doses. And the proportion of patients responding is similar with these waterfall patients. Now, interestingly here, these sets of figures are trying to understand the the frequency of response and the depth of response based on the specific DNA alteration, the specific gene that's altered. And here we do see a difference. It gets a little bit tricky uh, to sort through all these different colors. But for instance, if you look at the top left, if we're looking specifically at the red bars, which are BRCA1 and 2, there are very few patients that do not have a PSA response. They have a PSA rise as their best response to therapy. In fact, there's only three red bars that have a PSA rise as their best response to therapy. They're, the rest of the patients have some degree of PSA reduction, with the majority of them having over 50% reduction in their PSA. If you look at the radiographic responses, you see a similar, a similar situation. There are four red bars that have a rise or an increase in the size of the lesions, whereas most of all the other patients that have BRCA alterations have a thesis response of at least. In contrast, if you look at the green bars, use, which is PALB2, you can see, or, or even better yet, ATM, which is blue, you can see that there are very few patients, in fact, only one patient that has a PSA50 response, and only two blue uh, bars, which rep again represent ATM, that show a resist partial response or better. You can see that graphically in the Kaplan-Meier curves in the bottom left. Uh, the BRCA, which is the red, has a significantly better uh, duration of response. Dark blue, which is ATM. But again, if you look at the swimmer plots in the bottom right, you can see that regardless of the alteration, there are always some patients that respond. It's just the likelihood of responding is higher with BRCA1 and 2 compared to some of the others. And finally, in terms of a registrational trial for a laparec, this was uh, demonstrated with the PROFOUND trial, which was a randomized phase three clinical trial. You can see that the key eligibility criteria include uh, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer with disease progression on one prior novel hormonal antiviral or enzalutamide. And patients also must have at least one qualifying uh, gene alteration uh, with a direct or indirect role in HR chronic. So they specifically broke it up into cohorts. Cohort A was those patients that seemed to have the best response to therapy, BRCA1, 2, and cohort B, which was any other alteration. Patients were treated with a lap rib 300 milligrams twice daily or the physician's choice in their next uh, therapy. And the primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. Uh, there was a number of key other secondary endpoints such as overall survival. If you look at the alteration list, 
um, that was included. You can see it listed down below, including BRC1 to ATM, but also BARD1, BRIP1, CDK12, and some others. Note they did not include things such as HOXP13, MSH12, or anemia genes. So looking at the baseline characteristics between the patients, specifically looking at cohort A, the average age was similar between the two. Presence of metastatic disease and initial diagnosis was similar between the two groups. Uh, roughly 23 to 22% uh, respectively for Olaparib and the physician's choice um, within cohort A. The uh, median uh, baseline PSA was higher uh, for patients in the physician's choice group compared to Olaparib. Um, the ECOG performance status was similar between the two. The number of patients that had received previous novel hormonal therapy was equivalent between the two groups as well as previous taxing. Um, and that is true both within cohorts A and cohorts A plus B when you're comparing Olaparib versus the physician's choice treatment. Looking at the primary endpoint of Profound, which again is radiographic progression-free survival, we see a significant improvement in clinical outcomes in those patients treated with Olaparib over the physician's choice therapy. Again, this is cohort A only that we're looking at here. So the proportion of patients that were still responding to therapy at 12 months was 28% for Olaparib and less than 10% for physician's choice therapy. The median radiographic progression-free survival was 7.39 months for Olaparib and 3.55 months for physician's choice therapy. This was statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.34. Again, demonstrating a significant benefit that these patients are receiving with the laparate therapy over any other FDA-approved option at that point. Looking at the efficacy by cohort, uh, if we look specifically at cohort B, which is those patients that have some alteration that is not defined by BRCA1, 2, or ATM, we see that there is a numerical improvement over the physician's choice, but it was not statistically significant with the hazard ratio of 0 0.88, but the 95% confidence interval spanning from 0 0.58 to 1.36. If we look at the radiographic progression-free survival, in terms of investigator assessed, not blinded independent uh, review, it statistically significantly benefited Olaparib over physician's choice with a hazard ratio of 0 0.6, with the 95% confidence, percent confidence interval spanning 0 0.39 to 0 0.9. So the overall survival, again, specifically for cohort B, it favored the Olaparib treatment, but was not statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0 0.73 and 95% confidence interval spanning 0 0.45 to 1.23. So the, the, the majority of benefit appeared to be in those patients that were in cohort A, which was Again, BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM. And each of those factors, the radiographic progression-free survival, again, the primary endpoint, the objective response rate, and the overall survival were all statistically significant. In fact, again, highlighting cohort A in terms of the overall uh, objective response rate, 33% of patients compared to 2.3% of patients had a resist-defined uh, response, meaning a significant reduction in the size of their tumors as, as evaluated on scan. So looking at the specific type of genes and the, res, the objective response as defined by each specific gene, you get a flavor of this variability of response. Now, it is important to note if you're looking at the column or the figure on the right, you can see that some of these genes were comparing very, very small numbers. So this is just to, to be hypothesis generating only. Again, because the numbers are too few. But if you look at the median radiographic progression-free survival, BRCA2, uh, it was significantly better at 10.84 months compared to physician's choice, which was only 3.48 months. Some gene alterations did not seem to significantly differ based on treatment. For instance, if you look at ATM, the median radiographic progression-free survival was only 5.3 months compared to 4.7. Um, of those patients treated with physician's choice. It is important to think about the specificity of these treatments. So does the um, BRCA-ness or, 
presence of having a DNA repair defect predict response to other therapies, for instance, novel hormonal therapies with abiraterone or enzalutamide. So in this study that, that was published in 2019 by Charles Sawyer's group, they did a comprehensive genomic assessment of 429 patients, 128 of them were treated with novel AR-directed therapies such as abiraterone or enzalutamide, and the, the clinical outcomes were reported. So if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, which is in the figure on the right, you can see that they all are relatively similar. Those that are taxane naive and hormone therapy naive, those that are taxane exposed and hormone therapy naive, et cetera, they're all relatively similar in terms of their duration of response. So this treatment it does not seem to suggest a difference in the prognosis of the disease. The, the biology is fairly similar in concern. And specifically looking at the response in, in that group of those patients treated with the novel hormonal therapies compared to those that were wild type, you can see no significant difference between the Kaplan-Meier curves. Again, in this group, if you look at the which specific DNA alterations they had, the majority of them had BRCA or ATM alterations in an incidence that was similar to what we see in other groups. So PARP inhibitor therapy is more than just Olaparib. So far I've shown you the Olaparib data, but we also have the Triton series of trials, which is Recaparib, and we also have the Galahad series of trials, which is Niraparib. So each of these has demonstrated a response. I've for the most part just shown Olaparib because it is the first one, but each of these other PARP inhibitors also have demonstrated significant uh, clinical efficacy. So for instance, in the Triton 2 trial, which again is Recaparib, they looked at patients that had progressed on one, two lines of novel androgen receptor therapy, again, abiraterone or enzalutamide, and one line of chemotherapy in the metastatic CRPC space. So as of the time of their data cutoff, they had 136 patients that were enrolled that had at least 16 weeks of follow-up. And if you look at the baseline characteristics, uh, those patients that um, had a high Gleason score was fairly conserved across all the groups, with the exception of ATM, it had a lower proportion. Um, the objective response rate was significantly different between each of these groups. Similar to the Olaparib data, um, those patients that had BRCA1 or 2 alterations had a, around a 50% response rate. But interestingly, out of 15 patients with ATM alterations, none had an objective uh, response. And those in the proportion of patients that had a confirmed PSA response was again around 50% for BRCA alteration. So again, patients with this genotype also appear to respond to recapture. So let's explore a, a patient that we've uh, treated here just to see the, the type of benefit that these patients can have. ML is a 63-year-old pharmacist with a PSA screening test performed in December of 2014, measured at 5.7 nanograms per mil. He was asymptomatic at that time. Uh, surveillance was continued. Repeat testing one year later in December of 2015 showed a PSA of 11.6 nanograms per mil. He was diagnosed with prostatitis and prescribed antibiotics. Repeat PSA testing in June of 2016 was 17.1 nanograms per mil. Prostate biopsy was performed 
Uh, this showed Gleason score five plus four equals nine, grade group five, prostatic adenocarcinoma. All cores from the left side of prostate were positive. In two of the sites, apex and base, the score was five plus four equals nine. In the mid prostate, the score was four plus four equals eight. Perineural invasion was present. Cores on the, uh, from the right prostate were negative for carcinoma. You can see here on the left, uh, on the top, sheets of prostatic adenocarcinoma with no evident glandular proliferation. In the lower panel, you can see uh, cribriform structures consistent with uh, pattern four. In some areas, these showed central uh, necrosis. A bone scan was negative for metastasis. A CT was negative for adenopathy or metastasis and showed a moderately enlarged heterogeneous prostate gland. Uh, in August of 2016, he was started on neoadjuvant Lupron plus bicalutamide, a prostate MRI with large left-sided peripheral zone lesion that demonstrated extracapsular extension involving the bilateral seminal vesicles, the left neurovascular bundle, and features worrisome for invasion of the rectum and the left obturator internus muscle. Uh, so here we have two representative examples of his MRI results. The figure on the left, which is the axial T2 weighted, we can see the loss of the prostate capsule in his left gland, and it's involving the seminal vesicle. In the sagittal T2 weighted uh, representative picture on the right, you can see how it's invading posteriorly, potentially concerning for rectal involvement. So, in March 2017, his PSA had declined and was measured at 1.63 nanograms per mil, uh, demonstrating a response to hormone therapy. And a month later, his prostatectomy was performed that showed a Gleason 5 plus 4 adenocarcinoma with a positive margin to the left lateral and left anterior circumferential margins. All lymph nodes of 22 that were sampled were negative for metastasis. Uh, prostate uh, was quite extensively involved by high-grade carcinoma. Uh, overall, uh, grade group 5 uh, score 5 plus 4 equals 9. On the left-hand side, you can see cribriform structures with areas of central comedotype necrosis uh, consistent with pattern 5 and also some areas of cribriform without necrosis consistent with pattern 4. On the right side, you can see areas of prostate cancer sowing some sheet-like growth uh, consistent with uh, Gleason pattern five. Tumor showed quite extensive extraprostatic extension in multiple foci. As you can see on the left-hand side, in the picture on the right-hand side, you can uh, see tumor in, uh, invading the muscular wall of the seminal vesicle, consistent with seminal vesicle invasion. Uh, microscopically, in the examination of the prostatectomy, there was invasion of the bladder neck. But intraoperatively, the prostate gland was found to be adherent to the obturator internus muscle, uh, rectum, distal uh, ileum, and bladder. So this tumor was staged as a T4. The AJCC stage was PT4N0. So his first PSA postoperatively actually rose to 4.77 nanograms per mil, and he was quickly referred to a radiation oncology, who ordered a procyclovine PET scan or axiom PET scan. We can see some representative examples here. So in the top left, you can see a potential liver lesion slash abscess. It was unclear at that time what it represented. You can also see in the top right, in his coccyx bone, uh, there's uptake um, SUV activity, demonstrating evidence of metastasis. Perhaps the uh, liver lesion is better seen in the CT only portion of his scan there. Also in the sacrum, the bottom right, you can see a separate bone metastasis that's present at that point as well. So he was referred, because of his metastatic disease, he was not offered radiation therapy and is referred to see me. I'm in medical oncology. We started combination dose taxol and lupron for the charted trial. 
And he also saw uh, medical genetics for germline testing, and we also sent uh, somatic testing via ventilation. And you can see that on his germline testing, he had a couple of uh, VUSs, interestingly, including BRCA2. The somatic testing showed a number of alterations, as you might predict, P53 and PI3 kinase mutations, given his aggressive allergy of disease, but, as well as P10. Um, but he also had uh, BRCA loss. While he was on chemotherapy, he developed neutropenic fever, um, was admitted to the hospital. Chemotherapy was held until the antibiotics were completed, and an abscess was identified on imaging and was subsequently effectively treated with these antibiotics. So a month later, his chemotherapy was resumed with both elasto support and a dose reduction. And one month later, a CT scan was done to evaluate for the uh, resolution of the abscess. No progression of prostate cancer was found. His abscess was resolved. In January 2018, his PSA unfortunately started to rise and resaging scans were ordered. A few representative examples are shown here. On the left, you can see a marked increase in the number and size of liver metastases. And in the right, you can see an example of new uh, pulmonary metastases that are present although the majority of his disease is in the liver. So at that point, he started a laparib and PSA was 6.2. A month later, his PSA was 0 0.1. And given that relative discordance of tumor volume and PSA, I did restaging scans um, to ensure that there was radiographic response because with these aggressive cancers, sometimes you can see a discordance between PSA and cancer. You can see after only just a month of a laparib, his pulmonary metastasis has nearly resolved, as well as his hepatic metastases. Since then, his PSA has become undetectable, and periodic restaging scans have confirmed a complete radiographic response to the soft tissues, and he still has a few sclerotic bone lesions to the pulse. After being on treatment for about two years, a laparib was held because he finally developed a significant neutropenia. It rebounded very quickly with only holding for one month. Um, most recently, I saw him in March of this year, and his restaging bone scans were negative for metastases. CT chest had a few sclerotic lesions, but no new metastases. And again, he remains in a complete response in terms of his soft tissue of disease, and his PSA remains up. So given the great response that we see in some patients with these therapies, with monotherapy of PARP inhibitors such as laparib, rucaparib, and raparib, there are now ongoing trials exploring combination therapies with various treatments such as in combination with enzalutamide or in combination with checkpoint inhibitors such as pembrolizumab. In terms of fulfilling the promise of precision oncology and the use of PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer, a good biomarker for homologous combination repair deficiency is key. In the early phase of the use of PARP inhibitors in, in breast and ovarian tumors, the main focus was on germline BRCA1 and 2 mutations, and first-generation sequencing technologies were used. But now, because we want to assay many multiple genes involved with homologous combination repair, it's more efficient to utilize next-generation sequencing, typically in the clinical setting in the form of targeted panels. In the research setting, as we've seen, whole exome and whole genome sequencing are more commonly used, but these are not typically used in a clinical setting. We've seen that about 20-25% of advanced prostate cancers contain somatic mutations, and about 10% contain germline homologous recombination repair uh, gene mutations. So there's a role for both testing of germline and uh, tumor DNA. In terms of recommendations for testing, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, has issued the following guidance for germline testing. In terms of homologous recombination pair genes, the testing panel should include at least BRCA2, BRCA1, ATM, PALB2, CHECK2. And parenthetically, it also should include the mismatch uh, repair genes, which I haven't been talking about today, but they should be included in a germline uh, testing uh, panel for advanced prostate cancer. In terms of who should be tested, well, those uh, with a positive family history and 
regardless of family history, those with very high risk, regional, i.e. N1 disease or metastatic disease, and those with introductal uh, histology. Uh, just coming back to the definition of family history, it's a little bit involved, but as you can see on the slide, it includes the following uh, family history of a high risk germline mutation, for example, BRCA1-2, or in the context of microsatellite instability, Lynch syndrome, a brother or father or multiple family members diagnosed with prostate cancer, but not including clinically localized grade one disease, grade group one disease, less than 60 years old, or who died of prostate cancer, men of Ashkenazi uh, Jewish ancestry, and a history of three or more cancers on the same side of the family, especially if they're diagnosed less than or equal to 50 year old. And this includes bile duct cancer, breast, colorectal, endometrial, gastric, kidney, melanoma, ovarian, pancreatic, or prostate, but again, not clinically localized grade group one disease, a small bowel or urothelial. So it's sort of an involved family history set of criteria. Interestingly, uh, introductal histology is, is another of the criteria that should suggest germline testing. An introductal carcinoma essentially comprises a really dense cribriform or very atypical proliferation of malignant cells that involve pre-existing prostatic ducts and asini, uh, as evidenced by the uh, retained basal cells that you can see on the right side of the screen. And this is most usually regarded as retrograde spread from an adjacent high-grade uh, carcinoma. Limited data have suggested that introductal carcinoma is common in patients who carry a germline BRCA mutation and also that patients with germline homologous recombination repair gene mutations may be more common in prostate carcinoma with introductal features, hence the recommendation for germline testing when this histologic feature is seen. In terms of germline testing uh, follow-up, a positive result can certainly have therapeutic implications for entry into a clinical trial for a PARP inhibitor, but there also may be significant familial implications and follow-up uh, genetic testing is very important so that uh, cascade family testing can be arranged as appropriate. If there is a positive family history, even without a pathologic variant or likely pathologic variant, genetic testing is recommended. For example, if there's a germline variant of uncertain significance, additional research uh, can be done to try and reclassify the variant, for example, by examining the segregation of the variant in the family in question, or assessment of whether the variant has been seen in another family with hereditary uh, cancer. Germline testing issues can be complex in terms of the needed discussion with the patient and family, including issues of consent. Ideally, uh, pre- and post-test genetic counseling would be involved. However, in today's world, the situation isn't helped by the lack of genetic counselors that may be available to counsel in real time. Another issue that arises is the possible discrepancy between the reads on germline and somatic variant. There are different sets of interpretation guidelines and different reference databases that are used for interpretation. Remember that somatic analysis has the added complexities of things like uh, variable allele ratios and tumor heterogeneity uh, to consider. Given the potential uh, for cascade testing, billing may also be an issue with possible out-of-pocket uh, charges that could have consequence both for the patient and for the family. In terms of somatic testing, the NCCN indicates that it may be considered for patients with regional, that is N1 uh, disease or metastatic disease. And again, multiplex panel testing suggested for homologous recombination repair genes. Uh, and as I've just mentioned, germline and somatic variants are subject to different reporting requirements. And finding in one scenario may have a different connotation in the other scenario. So the bottom line is it's very important to note that if uh, somatic testing raises concern uh, for a germline uh, mutation, uh, it's recommended that genetic counseling conf for confirmatory germline testing happen if it's not already been done. In terms of issues with uh, somatic testing in, in prostate cancer, there are some of the same concerns that pertain to the testing of any solid cancer. With regard to the choice of sample to test, is it the primary or is it the metastasis? 
Generally, for uh, reasons of tumor evolution, the more proximate sample is likely the way to go. And likewise, with consideration given for resampling later in tumor evolution after uh, the tumor has been exposed to, to treatment. There may be tissue limitations when it comes to metastasis sampling in particular. And it may be that uh, techniques such as liquid biopsy may be helpful in, in that scenario if there isn't enough tissue available from metastatic sites. Tumor purity is certainly a consideration. The percentage of tumor cells should be at least twice the sensitivity of the detection of a mutant allele. And the assay for that allele at least is expressed as a percent. And as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, one technique that it can help is, uh, you know, focusing on areas of tumor and, and macro dissecting so that one increases the percentage of tumor from which the DNA is extracted. DNA integrity can certainly be an issue, and in particular in prostate cancer, where so many of the metastases are to the bone and where decalcification is often occurs, that uh, can certainly affect the assay. Uh, and uh, likewise, uh, considerations given for how viable the tumor is, for example, if it's a metastasis in a lymph node, is it necrotic or does it look viable? And this issue certainly can be uh, significant, referred earlier to the profound trial where the centralized uh, DNA testing uh, was done. And in that case, they were successful in 69% of cases. So 2,793 out of 4,047, 31% of cases failed in terms of the sequencing. So this is still a significant issue. With regard to next generation uh, sequencing panel testing in prostate cancers, the, the issues are not specific. You know, these are panels, so you, you can't assay that which is not on the panel. So, of course, that leads to the question, what should be on the, on the panel anyway? Some of the other issues with uh, panel testing, uh, hotspot panel testing, is it may not identify medium to large scale genomic changes, for example, larger insertions or deletions, and that it can still be challenging in this scenario to get accurate copy number assessment. In terms of reporting variants, consensus efforts to standardize reporting have been sponsored by societies, including ASCO, College of American Pathologists, American uh, Molecular Pathology Association, and the ACMGG. And they have sort of standardized the reporting into tiers one to four. And tiers one and two tend to be regarded as uh, clinically actionable findings. Tier four, which are benign or likely benign variants, are, are not. And then, of course, we're left with the vexatious category of VUS or variants of unknown clinical significance. One other thing to think about is that, as with any uh, complex diagnostic activity, um, there may be inter observer variability among molecular pathologists in categorizing variants. And a final higher level issue is the significance of a positive finding. Uh, we're not talking about the technical aspect here, we're talking about the interpretation of the actual mutation. So, as we've seen, not all mutations in homologous recombination repair genes have the same connotation. So, for example, a mutation in BRCA2 has a different connotation than perhaps a mutation in ATM or CHECK2. That needs to be taken into account. In terms of future possibilities, one idea is to ask uh, whether there's a way to assay the phenotype of homologous recombination repair. And this could be either by genomic or perhaps transcriptomic signatures. One example of this is the idea of what's called genomic scars, which are characteristic patterns of damage in the DNA indicative of deficient homologous combination repair. Two such tests have actually been approved uh, by the FDA for, in this context of ovarian cancer, where they detect characteristic structural abnormalities in, in DNA. The limitation with this test is that these are permanent changes in the DNA, and yet it's known that tumors may recover and regain homologous recombination repair, and in that case, no longer be responsive to a PARP inhibitor. But yet, because the genomic scars are permanent, they're still, the test would, would test positive. Another idea includes possibly if assessing the functional state of the homologous recombination repair pathway either by assessing ex protein expression, exa for example, uh, immunohistochemical staining for some of the components uh, involved in homologous recombination repair, or by some kind of ex vivo 
assay uh, such as uh, assessing proliferating cells uh, that have been hit with DNA damage and looking for the characteristic response accumulation of gamma H2AX and RAD51 nuclear focus formation. Uh, but these are ideas, difficult tests to do. And in the field of, of coming up with a good biomarker for homologous recombination repair that may be independent of a given mutation status, there's still a lot of uh, work to be done.